good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, thanks Please. for doing it. I'm of so course. sorry I'm late. I know oh, I'm coming late. But not yeah. at all. It I'm, gave us more chance to tweak the lights for the 50,000th time. So. You're doing well? Yes. How often are you coming into the office these days? About uh, two to three days a week. Yeah. Uh -huh. How about you? I guess you come in. Yeah, I'm in every day now. So no more kids on the set. Yeah. I have to ask, is your son still mining Ethereum? He and I literally were talking about <laughs> it last night. He's like, Dad. You are the one who made me give up on it. I'm like, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, the thing that's good about this is I think it excites a whole new generation about mm -hmm. technology, which mm -hmm. is which is good. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you for doing it. I and really thank you for coming down to do it. I'm ready to go when you guys are. From Google headquarters in Mountain View, California, this is Bloomberg Studio 1.0 with Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai. Born and raised in India, Pichai had almost no access to a computer until college, but just years later found himself rising through the ranks of the world's largest search engine. In 2015, it was Pichai that Google co-founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin chose to run Google and later Alphabet. Now valued at more than $2 trillion, it's one of the most powerful companies on the planet. Sundar, it's great to be with you today. Thanks for doing this. Great to be here in person. Google just hit a $2 trillion market cap. Alphabet, I should say. Where is the next trillion dollars going to come from? You know, I've always felt, uh, you know, your market cap valuation is an effect of the value you mm -hmm. provide. And... I feel fortunate our mission is timeless. Uh, you know, there is more need to organize information than ever before. Uh, I still feel search is our biggest moonshot as a company. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people will want radically more conversational experiences. Mm -hmm. They will want uh, what we call multimodal experiences. They may speak to search. They may look at something and ask what, what the information mm -hmm. is. Being able to adapt to all that and evolve search will continue to be the biggest opportunity. Mm -hmm. We are so excited about, be it YouTube, cloud, our, our hardware products, Google Play. So we're building a diverse set of businesses, but and underlying all of it is uh, the investments we are making in AI. You know, we've invested hundred billion dollars in R and D in the past five years, mm -hmm. and so applying AI in a deep way is probably where we will create the biggest opportunity ahead. Microsoft is making some big acquisitions. Apple's anti-ad tracking technology is shaking up the industry. What do you make of these competitive moves? Your competitors say they're on the right side of history. Are they? I look at the fact that there are 3 billion people who have access to knowledge at their fingertips. I look at the opportunity we provide. Mm -hmm. I look at the skills people are learning through YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I feel it everywhere when I go talk to people. And, and providing access to information and knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, I think will end up being on the right side of history as well. Your predecessor, Eric Schmidt, told me that he feels the latest Facebook revelations are disturbing. Google also has access to massive amounts of our data. Why should half the world's population, more than half the world's population, trust Google to do the right thing? We are trying to do more with less data. Uh, one of the biggest uh, changes we made was making auto delete uh, the default setting for new users signing in, and now over 2 billion users have their data continuously being deleted. Look, we rely on trust for people. You know, every day when people come to Google, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they place their trust in us in vulnerable moments. Uh, it may be a health issue on which they are trying to understand. You know, there's no more uh, important uh, responsibility we have than doing right by that trust. You know, when, when we provide Gmail to journalists and realize that their accounts may be under attack uh, by, by an authoritarian government. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you know motivates us to make sure, be it mm -hmm. privacy, be it security, be it mm -hmm. trust, we are doing the right thing. Over time, regulation will have an important role to play here. Mm -hmm. I think privacy regulation is important. Mm -hmm. In areas like AI, regulation will be important. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know those will be part of the uh, answers as well. The Facebook fallout, that Instagram can be toxic to teens, for example. Has this raised more or new concerns for you about the impact of technology, tech addiction, algorithms, YouTube even, on our children and their development and their mental health? I mean, you're a parent and you also have a lot of power over how this plays out. You know, I mean, 
like you, uh, you know, uh, bringing kids up in this modern digital world is something I think all parents are anxious about, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, it's part of why a few years ago when in YouTube, you know, we, we were exposed to a set of concerns, mm -hmm. you know, we invested, it became the, our number one priority to work hard at it. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason YouTube invested so much in developing YouTube kids mm -hmm. as a safe destination for young children and so on. Look, technology is going to play a big role in helping give children the next wave of opportunity as well. So the answer is to develop it responsibly. We have changed our balance in these areas and saying, we think about content responsibility first, mm -hmm. and then the pace of development or new features in, in areas like YouTube. And mm -hmm. so that's how we have approached it for a while. Facebook and Microsoft are all in on the metaverse. What do you think about the metaverse? What's Google's metaverse strategy? It's always been obvious to me that computing mm -hmm. over time will adapt to people and people adapting to com computers. Mm -hmm. You know, you won't always interact with computing in a black rectangle in front of you. Mm -hmm. So just like you speak to people, you see and interact, you know, computers will become more immersive. They'll be there when you need it to be. So I've always been excited about the future of uh, immersive computing, ambient computing, AR. And we are Does that in, count as the metaverse? Is that what that is? You know, metaverse <laughs> is, it, I think it means different things to different mm -hmm. people. The way I think about it is evolving computing uh, in an immersive way with augmented reality. As part of that, there'll be many experiences, mm -hmm. some of which will be immersive, interactive mm -hmm. virtual worlds, uh, you know, which is, which is the metaverse concept. And, you know, but I think this doesn't belong to any company, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the evolution of internet and you know the web the internet all of it will continue to evolve google was famous for its campuses where you could go and never leave you had everything you ever wanted now you've said they can be flexible they can work from home they can work at the office they can be hybrid they can work remotely permanently perhaps are you committed to really letting them do this forever and if so how does that change the future of work and society look we have we have We've really embraced the, the uh, fact that the future is going to be flexible. At Google, we've always tried to give uh, you know, uh, agency to our employees. Uh, but we do realize the importance of bringing people together, uh, the creativity, community, and collaboration that comes with it. So the balance we are striking is, is this notion of three, two. And what we're giving, the strength of our company is we have more locations than uh, most of the companies. So we're giving people choice to move anywhere in the world four weeks they can work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. We're gonna accommodate 20% uh, of our workforce uh, to be remote uh, over time. So we're gonna embrace that flexibility. And, forever? Uh, forever? Yeah, forever, yeah. And you know, we're committed to it. Through it all, it forces us to design better products. And since people use Google Workspace mm -hmm. to run their companies, I think it gives us a chance to innovate and bring all that out. Uh, you know, I think there is so much value in giving people more flexibility between their personal and professional lives. And I think it will lead to people being happier. And I think companies can be successful in that model. And so we are trying to get the best of both worlds, but embrace the flexibility and, 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 and see where, where we go. How confident are you that when you look back, you'll be able to say Google did enough to help save the world? We are. Uh, putting so much uh, energy and resource into it. You grew up in India, you lived through droughts, water was scarce. How has that experience shaped your feelings about the urgency of stopping climate change? You know, I grew up in Chennai, India, and a big part of my childhood was, uh, you know, really pretty severe water scarcity. You know, we would get water trucked in uh, for the streets and stand in lines and carry a few buckets of water home. There was no running water for many years. And, you know, but fast forward a few years ago, you know, Chennai had one in a hundred year flood, uh, you know, which was a very extreme event. Kind of drove home. That combined with a few years ago, waking up to the orange skies here in the Bay Area, seeing the look of concern on my children's faces and having to explain it, uh, you know, all kind of drove home uh, in a deeply personal way for me. So I think it's the, the most defining issue we all face and 
and you know definitely something very motivated on working towards. I remember waking up to those orange skies too and having to have that same conversation with my kids. Do you think the commitments at COP26 went far enough? You know, I'm encouraged by many things. Uh, you know, we have to tip our hat to the people who are working super hard. Uh, the issues and the trade-offs are, are genuinely difficult. You know, you have to keep the economies growing. Uh, it, you know, it really matters. And But at the same time, uh, it's a pretty severe, urgent issue. So I'm encouraged by the progress. I think it builds on the Paris Agreement. So I can see the forward progress. Uh, there is the deep anxiety that it all may not be enough. Uh, but, you know, we have to be optimistic and keep pushing. Google has set some aggressive targets to run entirely on clean energy, to be the first tech giant to do so 24 hours a day. How confident are you that when you look back on this time, let's say a decade from now, you'll be able to say Google did enough to help save the world? Uh, we are uh, putting so much uh, energy and resource into it. It's always been kind of a founding value for us. We've been carbon neutral since 2007. Uh, we've been matching our energy consumption with renewable energy over the past few years. So this you know, we are now pushing, it's a moonshot, to be 24-7 carbon-free. That means every search you do, every email you send, that we can do it carbon-free. We were at 61% uh, in 2019. The number is now 67%. We have set our goals to be 100% by 2030. And to do it globally, that means we have to solve new things which we haven't done before. Mm -hmm. Wind and solar alone won't be enough. Mm -hmm. We just started uh, geothermal in Nevada. We will be investing in newer technologies, including carbon capture, et cetera, over time. So that's what excites me. We are a technology company at heart. So part of the, there are many answers to this problem. Some of it is that we are going to have to innovate our way out of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we want to push as hard as possible in doing that. Our Bloomberg New Economy Forum is happening this year in Singapore, and the Asia Pacific region is one of the fastest growing internet economies on the planet. Where do you see the most room, the most opportunity for Google to grow there? Uh, you know, it's such a, a fitting uh, time frame. Uh, you know, I'm glad you're focused on the region. It's the most vibrant region we see. It's our 20th year since we opened our office in Tokyo. It's, it was the first office outside the Bay Area. Um, you have two and a half billion people on the internet. There are many areas in which they are, they are leapfrogging trends which are here and embracing the future. Digital payments is a great example. So many of our products originated from APAC, Google Maps, mm -hmm. Google Pay. Uh, a lot of the, our journey to bring computing to more people mm -hmm. is, is playing out in Asia as well. I am excited about also the work we are doing through cloud mm -hmm. because the companies there are rapidly transforming themselves digitally. So a chance to provide that is something very exciting for us. It's a super dynamic region. I feel like we are learning as Google, being in the region. And so I think it'll transform. The first 10 years, I would have said we took products here mm -hmm. and brought it to APAC. Mm -hmm. Over the past few years, we are beginning to build things there. Mm -hmm. And some of our future global products will be APAC first and rest of the world later. You can't talk about APAC without talking about China. And you're facing stiff competition from Chinese tech giants there and beyond. What should U.S. policymakers know about competing with China? You know, there's a lot of conversations about U.S. and China. The competition is fierce. Mm -hmm. When you look at areas like AI and quantum computing, where we are investing a lot, uh, you know, the Chinese companies are uh, neck to neck. What I, I think about, you know, I was encouraged by the news coming out of Glasgow mm -hmm. about the U.S.-China agreement on climate. To me, while we talk about all the all the areas where we are competing, mm -hmm. some of the biggest areas which are, are common challenges for all of humanity, mm -hmm. the pandemic was one, mm -hmm. AI and AI safety mm -hmm. over time will be a shared one. Obviously, sustainability is another area like that. So I think these are all areas in which the countries can come together. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a way by which we think about as, you know, when we compete on the internet and there may be different visions of how the internet plays out. So I see opportunities both sides. What are the chances that Google search will ever come back to China or that Google Cloud would ever come to China? 
you know, today we don't provide most of our signed-in services in China, and I don't see that changing. Uh, but you know, there are ways, as I said, in areas like AI or sustainability, I think there'll be opportunities for us to work together. Mm -hmm. Through cloud, we will support multinational companies which have presence everywhere, and so maybe there are opportunities to work that way as well. AI is advancing at an astonishing rate, and it is hard to understand sometimes what this really means. In concrete terms, how will our lives look different? let's say 10 years from now, as a result of AI? You know, done correctly, you know, in many ways, it's going to be helpful to you. Uh, you'll take it for granted. The same way today, for example, in India, over one third of the queries on many phones come through voice. Mm. That is something people take for granted. You can do it. So over time, you'll expect to speak and be able to understand any language on, in the world. And you know, those are all ways it's going to make it better. You may go to a doctor's office and go through a scan and, and the system may be prioritizing for the radiologist so that they don't miss some important things, maybe giving them a second opinion. Mm -hmm. you know, so these are all ways in which it will seamlessly start playing a role. And I think we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see the effects of that. You mentioned if done correctly, and there are concerns. There are fears that AI will replicate the worst of society, even under Google's own roof, from your own researchers. What scares you most about AI? What keeps you up at night? It's the most profound thing we are working on as humanity. And, and any time you're developing technology, there is a dual side to it. Mm -hmm. I think the journey of humanity is harnessing the benefits while minimizing the downsides. Mm -hmm. The good thing with AI is it's both going to take time I think I've seen more focus on the downsides early on than most other technology we've developed. So in some ways, I'm encouraged by how much concern there is. Hmm. And you're right, even within Google, you know, uh, you know, people think about it deeply. We publish a lot of research. There are, I think it's more important that there are outside academic institution, governments, nonprofits looking at this issue as well. So I think it's it, it'll, it'll be an issue which will have a lot of attention, which gives me a lot of comfort as well. You said you'd pick up some new hobbies in the pandemic. What did you start? You know, cooking pizza, just learning to cook, which I was never good at. I've gotten a little bit better. You have presided over Google through massive social movements that reverberated in and outside the company. What have you learned as CEO since the walkout? For me, you know, it, it, was, it was a moment, I think it changed the company for the better. Uh, you know, we've always been committed. It gave us an insight on what more we could do. Uh, we undertook deep commitments. And the biggest, uh, you know, overall in diversity and inclusion, I think, if you're committed and you actually put in the effort behind it, you can make a difference. Now we have stated clear goals. We are on track to meet, this, meet those goals. But it, it forced us to think about new answers. So for example, you know, tech companies used to talk about the pipeline problem, mm -hmm. but you, we are now going to places where the talent is. We are working mm -hmm. much harder. So going to Atlanta, going to DC, going to Chicago, going to New York, that's improving our uh, diversity and representation at all levels. The war for talent is even more competitive now yeah. in this new world. What are you offering? Elon Musk has said big tech is a place where talent goes to die. How do you respond to that? Look, I, uh, I look at the fact that you know we are looking to hire 30,000 people next year. Uh, I look at the impact we have on many people mm -hmm. coming and working uh, in the latest cutting edge things. and. Many people come in, people leave Google. We are proud of people who have left Google. There are, I think there are over 2000 companies that have been started by whom we call as Zooglers. I'm equally proud of that, right? I think we are one part of a, a, a big big system. And, you know, uh, I, I, think, I think I'm proud of uh, the role we play in uh, bringing in people and the impact they have over time in the outside world. All right, that's most of the heavy stuff out of the way. We're gonna do some rapid fire just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, you said you'd pick up some new hobbies in the pandemic. What did you start? Uh, you know, pizza, uh, you know, cooking pizza, just learning to cook, which I was never good at. I've gotten a little bit better. 
Cricket or soccer slash football? Wow, it's tough. Uh, both. <laughs> Please don't make me choose. <laughs> okay. Um, Squid Game or Ted Lasso? I watched both, though Ted Lasso is much more calming, you know, and so I'd rather take Ted Lasso over Squid Games any day. I know you're a voracious reader, so what's the last good book that you read? You know, I've, I've been on a podcast bench, so a lot more podcasts than books nowadays. Okay. Favorite videos you watch on YouTube with your kids? A lot of music videos, mm -hmm. uh, music videos. Uh, this whole notion where creators are watching other things and commenting on it, it's a trend which my kids are really into, and I've kind of gotten used to it now. So, you know, watching other games, it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon. Screen time policy that's worked for you as a parent, and what's, what's not worked? You know, I've, uh, I've kind of given agency to my kids. The only thing I tell them is that I can look at their digital well-being mm -hmm. uh, once in a while with them. Mm -hmm. and, and so... How do you do that? I ask them to show it to me, and they uh -huh. show it on mm -hmm. their phones. So, uh, you know, so that, that's pretty much the only thing. So beyond that, uh, you know, it's agency and, and uh, you know, and talking to them about it and making sure we are spending time doing other things. And making sure they develop good habits, That's basically. Right, yeah. um, metaverse or real world? Done correctly, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't feel it, feel the need to make a choice. You know, you always want to be present in the real world, and when you feel the need to do something, uh, you want to do that. But you know, I, I do think presence and the realness of the real world will end up mattering for humans for a long time. Do you own any crypto? Uh, I wish I, I did. I've dabbled in it, but you know, in and out. In and out, okay. Um, Larry and Sergey, I'm not gonna make you choose. Uh, how many times a week do you talk to them? Uh, you know, I, I talk to them regularly. Uh, you know, uh, it, it kind of ebbs and flows, uh, you know, and so there are times we get excited about something and we spend a lot of time talking it through, but it depends on, uh, you know, what, what I need. A piece of advice you wish you had in your 20s and a piece of advice you wish you had in your 40s. Uh, 20s would be, you know, being patient. Um, you know, I think when you're young, you're very impatient, which is a great thing. But sometimes you do amazing things by slowing down and being really focused and doing it over a period of time. And so I would advise the young, uh, you know, the younger version of me to be uh, more patient. Maybe at 40, I would say, you know, when I look at climate, you know, I want, want all of us to be impatient. So, you know, I feel like when there's an urgency towards something, I think the world needs to be impatient. So that's the advice I would give to an older version of me. How much do you personally wrestle with the decisions that you have to make? And how much longer do you see yourself being the CEO of Alphabet? Not just Alphabet, but also Google. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, Look, on the first one, uh, there are moments we all have to make tough decisions and, you know, and some decisions weigh on me. Uh, and but I, it's a privilege to do it. I have very good people helping me think, think things through. So I think the combination makes it all uh, you know, fine. Uh, on the second thing, I, I'm, look, it, it, I'm so energized by the things we need to do. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have much access to computing growing up. It changed my life a lot. Mm -hmm. The one laptop per child goal really motivated me to come into technology and, and when I look at last week, us launching an affordable smartphone in India, mm. the chance to bring the next billion users in Asia and in Africa online, that gives me a lot of energy. All right. Well, we'll be watching from afar. Sundar Pichai, thank you so much for joining us. It's Thanks, wonderful Sundar. Pleasure to be here. here.